Welcome to Charlie Lake Community Church. It's Sunday, January 17th. We're glad that you have taken this time to join along with us and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. As we gather, and whether you're watching live or whether you're going to watch later in the week, we know that you have a lot on the go. We know that you're busy, and so we're just so thankful that you've taken this time to, to, to worship along with us today. Not a lot in the way of announcements this week, but just a reminder that we do have the nursery, or the nursery. we do have the library open uh, from Tuesday to Friday, 9 to 12. If you want to just call ahead and we'll make sure that the doors are unlocked and you can come in and take part of, of uh, the library and get some books. And there's uh, some new additions that are going to be in here soon. And we're so thankful for that and, and thankful for uh, Carlissa for maintaining it and getting us new books in there all the time as well. And so if that's something that you've been wanting to do, get in here and use the library, we'd encourage you to just give us a shout and we would love to help uh, make that happen for you. As we uh, start our service today, uh, let's just open in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this place. I thank you that as we gather in your name in these coming moments that we do so um, not because... Uh, not because our weeks have been great, not because everything has gone the way we want, but because you have asked us to worship you. You have, ha you do, you have required us to worship you, and we do so with a thankful heart. So, Father, as we go through this time of singing, as we go through re the reading of Scripture and looking at your word and, and, and coming to you in prayer, I just pray that in all that we do, we will be honoring to you, whether we are at home, whether we're watching uh, at work, on our, our, on our phone or whatever that looks like. We pray that this time ahead will be a time of worship. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. This morning, we're going to hear our worship from the Hobb family, and we're appreciative of that. And then our scripture reading is going to be from Phil Utes. And then we will come back here and have our time of pastoral prayer and a look at the word of God. Will you stand with us as we worship at this time? <laughs> Oh, 
so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame when I call you answered me you greatly emboldened me may the kings of the earth praise you Lord when they hear what you have decreed may they sing of the ways of the Lord for the glory of the Lord is great though the Lord is exalted he looks kindly on the lowly though lofty he sees him from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. Thank you to our worship team and thank you to Phil uh, for reading the scriptures this morning. It's a joy to see uh, some new faces every week reading scripture and to get a little glimpse uh, into people that we haven't been able to see for a while. And so thank you to everybody who has been reading the scriptures over these last number of months. It's been uh, one of the highlights of my week. Uh, just before we get into the message today and in, in our continuation of the book of Acts, I want to just take a few minutes to pray. Let's, uh, will you join me in prayer, please? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this time. I thank you that we can continue to lift one another up uh, through encouragement and, and even as we now enter into this time of prayer through prayer. Father, I thank you that you have gone before us, that you know what our year looks like, that you know what each and every one of our lives look like in these coming, uh, these coming uh, months ahead. So Father, as we continue to worship you uh, through... Um, through social media and worship you through uh, video cameras, and, and it's also unique. We know that, that the time will come at some point, likely this year, where we can uh, have a regular time of meeting, a regular time of rejoicing, and so we're thankful for that. Father, we pray continually for our healthcare workers. We know uh, that they are busy. We know that they are feeling overwhelmed, and even our numbers up in northern BC are quite high right now, and we know the hospitals are busy as well. And so we just pray for our doctors, our nurses, all of the support staff in the hospitals, that you continue to be with them as well. Father, we pray for Jake, and uh, we just pray that you'll continue to be strengthening him, building up his health. We know that 
uh, Father, in the days to come that he has uh, many things on the go with his health, and we just pray that your will will be done in each and every one of those aspects and each and every one of those things. Father, we pray uh, for our brothers and sisters down in the States this week as they have the inauguration. We pray that, uh, Father, it will be a peaceful transition of power. We pray that, um, that Father, your, um, your peace that surpasses all understanding uh, will be upon them, will be upon their leadership, will be upon the people in the states. And we just pray that uh, you will continue to, to guide their path. Father, we thank you for our politicians, and we pray for our premier, we pray for our prime minister, and our MLAs, and our, our MPs. We just pray uh, that you will continue to guide them, give them insight and wisdom. Pray for Dan Davies provincially as he, as he continues to do work uh, on our behalf up in the Peace Region North here. We pray that you'll continue to guide him. We pray that you'll continue to um, um, be at work in his, uh, in, in his uh, area of expertise as he, as he guides us and leads us uh, provincially. Uh, Father, we pray for Bob Zimmer. We just pray that as he continues to be our MP, that you will give him wisdom, insight, that he will speak boldly on our behalf. And Father, we know uh, the travel that is involved with both of these men, that it, it's a lot of travel, a lot of time away from their families. And so we just lift them up in a special way today as well. Father, we thank you for our, our church in Fort St. John Christian Life Center. And as they are meeting this morning, we pray that you'll be with their leaders, that you will be with um, their congregation in these weeks ahead as well. And we think of our CBWC church, First Baptist Nipoa in Manitoba. We just pray for their, their pastors, their leadership. Uh, that in all they do, all they say in these, these coming days, coming weeks, that they will be glorifying to you in the community in which you have called them to serve. And so we thank you for all these things in your heavenly name. Amen. So we're going to continue on our look at the book of Acts today. We're going to finish up chapter 18, starting in verse 23, and we're going to go into the first seven verses of chapter 19 this morning. I want to. I, I want to uh, just start by saying the first, or th this passage of scripture really, in my mind, uh, reverts and 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 draws attention to the fact for for good biblical teaching, for strong teaching, for an understanding of the scriptures. We're going to see on a couple of occasions in this passage of scripture. Um, ways where people used mentorship, ways where people used guidance to help those that were not fully integrated with what Jesus had done yet. And we see in this passage of scripture, uh, both with Priscilla and Aquila and with the Apostle Paul, where they take and they, they guide and they move somebody from uh, an area of uncertainty, of, of, of lack of knowledge, into a further and, and more vibrant understanding of what Jesus had done for them. And as I was looking through this passage of Scripture, it struck me that as I look back on my life, particularly as I was in elementary school and in junior high, I can think of many of my Sunday school teachers. I had some absolutely wonderful Sunday school teachers, Sunday school teachers that I would look forward to hearing from every single week. You would walk into that class and they... You, you, you could just sense and you could understand that they loved every child that was in that class, that they cared for us deeply, that they had spent a lot of time preparing and getting ready for their lesson. Some of those teachers, I remember, they, they opened up the Bible to me in a new, brand new, fresh way. They gave me a passion for the Word of God, even as a young child, because of their passion for the Bible. And so... We are reminded of those passionate people in our lives, those people that, that love the Lord, that are living and serving the Lord and telling others about their love and, and, and their, their expectancy of what God is doing in our midst. Some of those teachers made the Bible just absolutely come alive. And some have had a lasting impact on my life. Now, the reality is, is that there are good teachers in our world. There are bad teachers in our world. Some of, the, some of the most dangerous teachers are maybe the most eloquent ones, the ones that as they speak, they just draw you in. But as we look at what they're saying and we put it up against the word of God, oftentimes it doesn't quite balance. It doesn't quite equal. And so we are called to be wise. We are called to, to discern. And in this passage of scripture, we're going to see on two occasions where this happens with the people. And so we want to jump into this. This is passage here is the beginning of Paul's 
third missionary journey. It's the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey, and he is going to go to a number of locations. Today, we find him in, in Ephesus. And Ephesus is, is, is in Turkey. Ephesus is one of those places that even today you can go and see the runes there. You can look and, and understand of, of what the culture looked like, what, what was going on there. And so Paul, in this third missionary journey, is going to go to a number of places. And, and, and in some of those places, as he enters, it, it's a second time that he's been there. And the first time that he was there, there was uncertainty, there was doubt. Sometimes he been, had been thrown out of these towns and, and, and of this region. But it says that Paul traveled from place to place, strengthening the disciples. So his goal, his, his journey, his mission was around making sure that people heard what Jesus had done for them. And then finding those that were in these places, in these cities, who had begun to preach, who had begun to teach, and strengthening them, equipping them for the ministry that they had ahead. Now, Ephesus was a place that was really the, the administrative seat of power in that region. It was on the western shore of Asia Minor. It was connected the Greco-Roman world with Asia Minor. And so you had these, these coming together of cultures all in one place. It had a seaport uh, as part of, uh, of, this, of the city. But the seaport, it needed constant um, dredging. If it, if it wasn't dredged, all the weeds would overtake it and, 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 and would just overcome the seaport. And the boats couldn't come in and out. Today, if you look at a satellite image of the city of Ephesus and the ruins that are, were there, you would, you're able to see this, uh, this lagoon, this, this, this port that's been totally overgrown by weeds, but you can see the outline of what used to be there, or what it used to look like. And it was also uh, a modern city. It had a paved road called the, uh, it, it, the Arcadian Way. It was, it was a, it's still visible today if you go and visit the ruins of Ephesus. And so it's within this setting, this modern culture, this place where we enter into today's uh, passage of Scripture and we see how God is at work in the midst of the ministry that was going on in the city of Ephesus. So starting at chapter 18, verse 24... And we're going to go from 24 to the end of chapter, verse 28, to get us starting this morning. It says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor, and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to stay in their home and explain to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, provide, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So Apollos, we find here, is our first example of the importance of having strong biblical teaching. Now, he comes onto the scene, and all we know of him, really, is that he was a strong Old Testament scholar. He understood the scriptures. He could quote the scriptures. And in many ways, he was probably a lot like the Apostle Paul was, very learned, learned very um, up on being able to discern what was going on. And we find in that passage of the scripture, too, that he also would debate in the synagogues. And he was a strong debater, a strong speaker. But he was this, this strong, learned Old, Tes Old Testament strong, uh, uh, scholar. rather. His understanding of the scriptures played an, an important role in the growth of the early church. We don't hear a ton about Apollos, but we do see places and we hear of places where he went in his ministry where churches grew, where they became more vibrant. And, and, and we're, we're to assume that as a result of this encounter with Priscilla and Aquila, that, that a lot of that was because of this time. 
And Priscilla and Aquila mentor Apollos. Now, we, we were introduced to this couple last week. They obviously had a lot going on. They were tent makers. They were, were actively involved in, in the ministry. And they were a couple and, and that were a team. They ministered together. They worked together. They, 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 they went through life together. We don't know if they had children. We don't know any of that. But we know that they were bold and they were brave in the, the telling of the gospel. And in this passage of scripture, we find out that they were bold and brave in going to somebody who was a scholar and saying, hey, there's more to the story. Let me tell you what else is going on. You see, Apollos did not have the whole story. It says in the scripture that he only knew of the baptism of John, but he was knowledgeable. He understood the scriptures. And here's maybe even more important. He was willing to to learn. He was willing to understand the deeper implications of the ministry of Jesus. Verse 26, I'm going to say that again. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So Priscilla and Aquila, they are hearing Apollos, and, 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 and as he's speaking, they're thinking, He's got a, a basic grasp of what's going on. But there's so much more that maybe he's not aware of. Now today, what would we do? We'd go online, we'd start a blog post, and we'd say, this person doesn't understand the gospel. This person is a false teacher. This person should not be listened to. Because that's how we think. Let's, let's, let's hammer down anybody that doesn't have the whole story. And as much as I hate saying that, that is the reality of likely what would have happened to Apollos if he was to be speaking somewhere today in that early stages. But Priscilla and Aquila, they don't see it as that. They see a young man or a man who has a lot of information, but hasn't been told the whole story. And so rather than condemn his message, they invite him into their home and it says that they, they explained more adequately the way of God, the, 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 the message of God. Isn't that beautiful? Think about that. Rather than condemn him, rather than say, you're not ready to be a minister of the gospel, they say, come to our house. Let us fill you in on some of the things that maybe you weren't aware of. And because of their willingness to do that, because of their, their boldness in doing that, it changed the course of, of, of history. It changed the early church. It changed Apollos', Apollos life. Now we see in this passage of scripture the marks of an effective uh, preacher and teacher. There's three things um, that, uh, three things really that we, we find in this passage that give us a little bit of insight in what it looks like to be a strong biblical teacher. Now first of all, the scripture says that he had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He was instructed in the way of the Lord, scriptures say. He understood what was going on in the Old Testament. He understood the scriptures, and he was able to, uh, to enter into conversations with people and, and have very wise, very insightful conversations with them. And I love that. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. Secondly, it says he spoke with fervor. Now, in other words, with an intensity, with a passion— and, and, and this one is, is, is one that I just love. You know, when you get up here every week, there are some weeks where, where I know that as you're looking at me, you probably have been able to say, that sermon was okay. But I don't think Josh was really that excited about it. And there are some weeks where, where passion almost overcomes me and I'm almost yelling at you and, and saying, this is what the word of the Lord says. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, when people can see a passion, when people understand that what they're hearing actually is real, what they're hearing means something to the speaker, they're going to tune in and listen a lot closer. That's one of the reasons I, early on in my ministry, I decided I'm not going to write out my sermons word for word. Because I, I just can't do that. There, there are some brilliant pastors, there are brilliant sermons I've heard where, where they're getting read word by word and the passion comes out. I'm not saying that it's bad if you read your message or read your devotional. But what I'm saying is for me, it became more difficult. 
And so there are times where I have to take a step of faith and, 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 and I say, Lord, let the words out of my mouth be honoring to you. There have been many times in a message where I look back and I can't believe that came out that way. And, and sometimes it, it's something that is goofy and, and people laugh. And sometimes it's something that as I get home, I'm like, oh, I should have said it this way. But I want the passion that I have for the word of God to come out. And, and, and we hear this in this scripture. He spoke with a fervor. He spoke with an intensity and a passion. Here's the third one. And this is as a result of this meeting with Priscilla and, and, and Aquila. He taught about Jesus accurately. And at the end of the day, that's what I want people to say about me. At the end of the day, I, 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 can, I can understand that, that there's some weeks where I'm not excited. There's some weeks where maybe I've had a bad week. You know, sometimes we have bad weeks and it's really hard to get up here and to speak. It's really hard to get up here and to say what the Lord has, has led on, on, on our hearts. Right now, it's hard because I'm just literally looking into a lens right now. And, and, and there's something about seeing people. There's something about recognizing, as, as, as normally I would look around here, and recognizing if something is actually impacting, if something is actually hitting the mark. There's sometimes I'll be in the midst of something, and, and as I look around, you can just tell that, that there's more confusion than hitting the mark. And those are my cues that, that it's time to move on, Josh. It's time to get to the next point. It's hard right now when, when you're looking into a lens. But my goal and my, my passion, I, in, in, in the midst of that, I still want the words out of my mouth to be accurate about the life of Christ. He proved from the scriptures, it says in verse 28, he proved from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. He took that knowledge. He made it into some passion. He was accurate about it. And because of that, he was able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that his message was an accurate description that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. I want to ask you the question today, are you willing to learn? Michael Wilkins says, though Apollos was a learned man, with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, he was willing to learn from his hosts when they took him home to complete his education. We will see that this is a characteristic of a true student of God's word. You know, I'm learning new things every week. Every time I read a passage of scripture, there are moments where for the first time in my life, something will come out and, and it'll, it'll hit me for the first time and I'll, I'll have this understanding and it'll, it'll make me research and look deeper into something. We need to be able to allow people to speak into our lives, to give us warnings sometimes, to, to remind us of our true uh, calling. Let's go on to Acts chapter 19, and we're going to do verses 1 to 7. It says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, what then, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and, and, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were about 12 men in all. So again, the marks of a strong, effective teacher pastor, apostle, in this case, the apostle Paul. Paul arrives in Ephesus, and he finds some of the people there that are being called disciples. Now, Luke uses the term disciples here, and obviously, in a bit of a looser way, right? We're not talking about, about the disciples who are leading the church. We're talking about disciples who have, have ha had a gathering of people to them because of their influence, because of the way they speak. But Paul comes, and he recognizes that just because people are calling them disciples doesn't mean that they've understood the whole story. And so he asks them about it. He says, he says, where have you got this message? Where and who is your baptism through? And, and they respond, our baptism is through John the Baptist. 
And, and the truth they understand is John the Baptist. And that's not bad. But Paul then takes this time and he asks them, have you men received the Holy Spirit as a result of that baptism? And their response is that we've never even heard of that, that, that there was a Holy Spirit. What does this mean? And essentially, they're telling Paul, can you explain more to us? And the translation from the original language would be closer to, we've never even heard that the Holy Spirit was available. They were in the dark. They weren't false teachers. They were teachers that had been given a platform that didn't have the whole story. And again, Paul recognizes this. He doesn't condemn them for their things they're leaving out. He doesn't condemn them because they didn't quite say things the way they were supposed to. But he teaches them and he reminds them and he tells them and he fills in the blanks of the things they don't know. You know, Paulus had progressed in his understanding of, Ju of who Jesus was. These men are different because they had stayed exactly where, where they were on the day of that baptism, that, that John's baptism. They understood that to be enough. And they stayed right there in that comfort level. They didn't have to worry too much. And now their lives are going to be transformed because Paul is saying there's so much more that has happened from that time to this time. And so Paul baptizes them and places his hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. Now the idea of the Holy Spirit was, was nothing new. In the Old Testament writings and scriptures, the, we, we get a sense of, of, of the Holy Spirit all throughout. Even in the beginning of creation, it talks about the Spirit of God was hovering above. And we get that idea all throughout the scriptures. But they didn't understand and at this point that the day of Pentecost to come. Remember way back months ago when we started the book of Acts, we, we talked about the, the day of, of Pentecost. What we don't talk about a lot in our in our society, or maybe in our denomination, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Pentecostals would talk about the Holy Spirit a lot more than we do as Baptists sometimes, is the Holy Spirit. It's, 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 it's the part of the Trinity that is maybe the hardest for us to wrap our minds around. A, a, a Father God who created this world, we can understand that Jesus who came to this world in, in, in the, the, the fullness of humanness, who died for our sins on the cross. We can wrap our minds around that. There's history books, non-biblical writings that talk about Jesus, talk about his ministry. We can wrap our minds around that. But what does this Holy Spirit mean? Now, back when I was younger, we almost always referred to it as the Holy Ghost. That idea of the Holy Ghost, and, 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 and then it's changed subtly over the last 30, 40 years to the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of you that are maybe at home, and, and, and this is all just gibberish to you, let me kind of take this down to its simplest form. We talk about the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I believe, today is God's continued presence here on earth. God sends his son. His son comes to earth. His son dies. His son is resurrected and goes back to heaven where he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. But Jesus is quite clear. He says, I am not leaving you alone. I'm not leaving in you in this place without help. And the Holy Spirit is at work. It's God's continued presence. Jesus didn't go up to heaven and then we just wait around twiddling our thumbs till he comes back. God is still here. His spirit is alive and well within this place. It's the spirit of God. I'll ask the question, have you felt the presence of the spirit of God in your life? I know there are many that will say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I've ever felt this presence of the spirits and and, and for some people, it, it's speaking in tongues. For some people, it's those tongues of fire that we hear about in Acts. That, that is the measure of if you've received the Spirit. But I can tell you over and over and over that the Holy Spirit has brought wisdom into my life. He's brought understanding and counsel into my life in ways that if I was by myself, I would not be able to cope. You know, sometimes we don't necessarily see the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is alive in everything that we do. That still small voice. 
I have had that happen so often, and I, I, I never used to claim it as the Holy Spirit and, and say it's the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, but I, beyond a shadow of a doubt now, it's happened so often that, that when I've listened to that still, small voice and I followed through with something, I can look back and say it was only God's voice that would have prompted me to do that. And it was something that happened at the perfect time for the perfect reason. That still, small voice. Sometimes we like to talk about our conscience. Well, sometimes the Spirit speaks to us, reminding us. And, and as we dive deeper into God's Word, that the Spirit can, can remind us of what we know, what we're aware of. The Spirit of God is everywhere. God always has and always will be on the move on this earth. Right from creation to, the, to the, when He returns again, when He sends His Son to gather us up into heaven, when he calls his believers to him. The Spirit of God is alive in it as well. I'd love to hear from you. Moments where maybe in your own life, where you have looked back and you say, it was only God's movement in my life that this happened, or I, I clearly heard God, God's voice in my life. Maybe you can shoot me an email this, this week. Maybe you can type it in on Facebook right now if it's something you're comfortable and want to share. But there are, are, I'd love to hear the stories. God is at work. The Holy Spirit is forever at work in our lives. So where do we go from here? Well, I want to encourage you that no matter where you're at, no matter if you're a teacher, no matter if you've taught Sunday school, I want to remind you that we're all teachers of the Word of God. The onus is on us, though, how intimately we are aware of the scriptures. The onus is on us on how much we are able to speak the word of God, memorize the word of God. Just like Apollos, I want to ask, do you have an intimate knowledge of God's word? But not only that, do you take that intimate knowledge and do you share it with a passion whether that's your kids or your family or a coworker, are you passionate about the Word of God? If I was to be up here and talk in a monotone voice like this and tell you, you know, God has changed my life. This happiness you see on my face is because of God. You probably wouldn't believe me very long. But God has changed my life. I am not perfect. I, I share that all the time. But there are so many incidences in my life where I look back and I think it was only the Spirit of God at work in my life, in the life of my family, that allows me to be where I am today. And in that passion, my passion is to give an accurate description of who God is, who His Son Jesus is, and, 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 and finally, who the Holy Spirit is. What is going on in our world? What is going on? You know, we're all created differently and our passions are different. But I know at home that you can be passionate with your children, with your spouses. With your spouse. <laughs> I'm not going to assume you've got multiple spouses. But you can be passionate with your family in sharing the word of God. You know how I know that? Because every person that I've met has a passion about something. Sometimes it is your family. Sometimes if you ask, how's your family doing? We will get such passion in response. Other times it's around a sport and, and, and men who claim to not be passionate about anything will talk for 45 minutes about their favorite team and who needs to go and who needs to come on the team. And it, it, it just blows me away the amount of passion that we can have for such things. How about this? Ask anybody. Go on. Don't really do this. But all you have to do is go on Facebook and say, what are your thoughts about COVID? And you will get passion. You will hear every thought that anybody ever has on the subject. And so we all have passion. And so I want to invite you today to use that passion and move it into the Word of God. Move that passion into something constructive and, and, and vibrant so your family, your spouse, you, your, your, your friends, your co-workers will know that is a man, that is a woman that understands and loves God. Then finally, I want to ask you, are you willing 
to work on your weaknesses. I love this, this passage. Aquila and Priscilla gently fill in the blanks for Apollos when they realized he still had more to learn. But Apollos was open and teachable. He put God before his own ego. Think back to the Apostle Paul. He had his ego before God. And then when God meets him on the road to Damascus, they change. And suddenly, his ego, he could care less about what people thought about him. All he wanted to do was tell people about Jesus. Be open, be teachable to hearing from others. We are all op to be open. We are all to be teachable and full of graciousness when people legitimately point out areas of weakness in our lives. We don't like to hear where we maybe struggle, where we're weak. But if it's something that you can look back and say there's a point there, be open to hearing that, be open to learning, be open to growing your passion for the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this place. And as we leave this place, I pray, Father, that we would all be teachers, that even those that have never seen themselves as a teacher before would look and, and, and view their role as a teacher of Christ. Whether it's just to a small group, whether it's just to their children, whether it's to their spouse or a friend or a co-worker, we are all teachers of your word. Help us to grasp that. Help us to be intimately aware of that and to be passionate about that love and to accurately portray who you are in this world. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you that he is alive and at work in every one of, in every corner of this world. Father, I know it's easy to discount that God is gone, that God, where is he? He's silent. But we know that your spirit is here, even in our dark moments, even in our moments of great love and, and excitement, you are here with us. So Father, help us to remember that. Father, help us to be teachable and help us to be gracious to one another. In your name, amen. As we leave this place today, I want to leave you with um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at, at all times and every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen.